grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. And greetings from First Presbyterian Church as we continue our reading through the New Testament. For this session, we are going to look at some of the shorter letters of the Apostle Paul. First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, the letter to Titus, and the letter to Philemon. These are very brief books, but they are so rich. And so I encourage you as you read these that you take time to savor them because just because they're brief, that doesn't mean they're less powerful than the other letters that Paul wrote of greater length. So I invite you now to join with me as we take a look at some of Paul's wonderful gifts in very small packages. Join us. Well, let's begin with the two letters to the Thessalonians. These were probably written in the early 50s, so early in Paul's ministry. And the first one, uh, 1 Thessalonians, this is where Paul first wants to encourage the faith of the new believers and let them know of God's love and God's truth that's being revealed to them and their promise of eternal life. But he also wants to encourage them and exhort them that the Christian faith is more than just getting the story right. I mean, it certainly is that. You want to make sure that the theology and the understanding of who Christ is, you have that, that clear. But also you want to be able to apply that to a godly life. In other words, your Christian faith should have an impact on the way you live and how you witness and how you engage other people. Also, he reassures the Thessalonians about the spiritual state of those who have passed on, because the early Christians had an expectation that Jesus was going to come back soon. And so there was some question as to, well, what happens to us if we pass from this life before Jesus returns? And so he gives them uh, some teaching about that. And then finally in 1 Thessalonians, he uh, finds it necessary to validate his role as an apostle. And this is a very important concept that will come to fruition in Timothy, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But the Apostle Paul wanted to make sure that they understood that he was, in fact, of apostolic status. Now, why is that so important? It's important because the one concern that we will have throughout these letters is false teachers. And so Paul wants to make sure that all those who come to faith have the story right. Well, how do you know what the story is right? You know because you got it from the apostles. And that's the difference between an apostle and a disciple. Now, all apostles are disciples, but not all disciples are apostles. Because the apostle, which means one sent, particularly by Jesus, they are the ones who saw Jesus, who heard what he taught, saw off his miracles from the very beginning. They had a personal encounter with Jesus. So Jesus invested three years into the life of 12 men. He lost one of them, Ad Matthias, and now the Apostle Paul. They're the ones with the real story. And that's why all of our truth that we embrace as a church is based on apostolic authority. And so Paul wants to make clear to the Thessalonians that what he's teaching is not just a matter of his own opinion or that he got it from somewhere else, but that, that this is, in fact, the divine word. Well, then we go to the second letter to the Thessalonians, which probably was written shortly after the first one. And in this case, he tells the Thessalonians how much he has been telling everybody about their faith, because they're so constant and they're so faithful, even in the midst of persecution. 
And he assures them that not to worry about those the ones who are persecuting them, that God will deal with them in his own good time. But there are two other issues that apparently are facing the Thessalonians that Paul wants to address. One of them is the question of, as I mentioned earlier, they're expecting that Jesus is going to come back soon, and they're wondering, hey, maybe the end times are here already. Maybe Jesus has already come back. What about those who have passed away? They missed it. And Paul wants to assure them, no, no, those who have already passed, they haven't missed anything. In fact, when Jesus does finally return and the whole world sees him, we will all meet the Lord in the air, meaning the dead and the Lord will be raised first and then we will join them in victory. So not to worry. But then he gives them a warning because there's a trap. If you guys are expecting the Lord to come soon, he says, that is not an excuse to be lazy. <laughs> in other words, don't think, oh, well, the Lord's going to come here, so I don't have to worry about the future, so I don't have to work, I don't have to uh, make plans for the future. And basically what Paul is saying is, no, as long as you are here, God has a purpose for your life. And what an important lesson that is for all of us. At different seasons of our life, we may think, well, you know, I don't have much time. I don't know why I'm here. If you are here, it's because God still has a purpose his purpose. And it's important for us to trust in that and try to discern what it is that God has called us to do in this particular season of life. Now, the Thessalonians were way up there in Macedonia, which is up in northern Greece. And we begin to see how far Paul's influence is, uh, has already reached early in his ministry. So all through Asia Minor, all the way going over into Greece, and then, of course, as you learned earlier when we read the book of Romans, his magnum opus, that he made it all the way to Rome. Now we turn to the two letters of Timothy. Timothy is a very extraordinary young man and is a wonderful example to us because Timothy was being mentored by the Apostle Paul. He was a protege of Paul's. And so we see in these two letters the mentor giving instructions to the protege. And what a wonderful lesson that is, because good leadership then trains up the next generation of leaders, who then train up the next generation of leaders after that. And that, by the way, is why we here at First Church are at First Church, because all of those who went before us taught the next generation. And that is the responsibility that we also need to have and embrace and that we not only train up those new believers, but we need to train up the next generation of leaders. So in 1 Timothy, Paul wants to give Timothy instructions on church order as far as worship and as well as what to look for as he goes about choosing leaders. It's a very interesting concept that a little bit different than the process we use now. Paul tells Timothy that, and also Titus, he has similar instructions in the letter of Titus that he wants them, Timothy and Titus, another protege, to where there are those various places where they're setting up churches to choose leaders. Now, in, in the old King James and in some other translations, sometimes it's translated bishop, but that, that position had not been developed yet in the church. Perhaps a better translation is an overseer. And the way we live that out in our church is elders. That the elders, both uh, teaching elders like your pastors and your ruling elders, which are those who serve on the session, that they are the ones that Paul is talking about. And he instructs Timothy to look for certain types of people to serve that role as overseers and also deacons. Well, when he gives his list, what's fascinating about the list that he gives, and as you read it, you want to pay close attention to um, the list of qualifications or characteristics that Paul lists. You'll notice that he doesn't give a list of duties. It doesn't say, here are all the things that elders are supposed to do. And I think oftentimes we think of eldership or even deacons as like a board of directors that make decisions about when to put a roof on and that kind of thing. Well, somebody needs to make those decisions, but that's not what Paul's talking about. Actually, on the 13, 14, 15 characteristics that he lists, they're all about that person's character. 
There's only two in the entire list that has anything to do with what elders do, and one of them is what they do at home. And the other one is that they need to be able to teach, that is, be able to share the gospel with another person. All the rest of them have to do with personal characteristics. Now, why is this? It's because Paul is trying to make it clear to Timothy, Timothy, you want to choose people on the basis of who they are, not by what, they, what they're called to do. Who are they? Because that will determine what they do and how they do it. And so many times our candidates for uh, who, people who've been nominated to be elders read that list and go, oh my, I'm not sure I can fulfill that. But the wonderful thing is that the Holy Spirit enables those whom he calls. But as you read that, this is so important for the congregation to read those sections of Scripture because the congregation is the one who eventually chooses their leaders. And it would be very well if our congregation really realized how essential our elders are and our deacons are in the life of the church. And you want to make sure that you're choosing those among us who have those characteristics. In 1 Timothy, he also talks to some degree about order of worship and family life and some very important things that uh, you'll want to savor. Now we move on to 2 Timothy. Now, 1 Timothy was probably written in the early 60s. And 2 Timothy, in many people's minds, was the very last letter that Paul wrote when he was in jail. Once again, Paul's in jail. He seems to frequent those places. Of course, always for the faith. And so it's like the mentor is now going to write his final instructions to Timothy. And a couple of things that come to mind to Paul as he writes this letter is that he wants to make sure that Timothy is clear on sound doctrine, that he is clear as to what Paul taught him, because now he's being commissioned to go and teach others so that they can teach. And it is so important that you get the story right, Timothy. You don't have to change it. You don't have to bring in other influences or whatever. Just teach the gospel as I, Paul, gave it to you, because I'm giving it to, to you the way my colleague apostles did and the way Jesus did. And it doesn't need to be creative. You don't need to come up with new cutting edge ways of thinking about it. The gospel is the gospel and teach it in its purest form. This is his most powerful um, teaching to Timothy and as he encourages him in his future ministry. Well, Titus is very similar in this regard. However, there's a few little details that are a little different, but it's interesting to compare also the list that he gives to Timothy about leaders and the list he gives to Titus. Titus is up on Crete, and he's to do the same thing. They're busy planting churches, and they need to find leaders and establish good church order as they go about it. Well, now we come to little Philemon. Now, why do I say little Philemon? It's little because in some Bibles, it's only one page. Yes, it's one chapter, but again, don't let that fool you. It's a powerful little letter that, quite frankly, helps us define human relationships in just a matter of a couple sentences. And it totally blows the institution of slavery right out of the water by just a couple of sentences. Sometimes Paul is criticized, or the Bible in general is criticized, for not having this extensive um, uh, treatise on the evils of slavery, and why don't we do that? And perhaps the Bible's even been accused of supporting slavery, which it doesn't. It acknowledges that it existed in that period of time. But Paul gets to the root of the matter. So what has happened? Well, there's a gentleman named Philemon who was a believer, and he had a slave named Onesimus. Now, we have to understand that slavery back in that time was very, very different. It was a bigger spectrum than the way we think of it in modern times. Usually when we think of slavery, we think of the horrific institution of black slavery in America and in other places. That did exist back in those days, in fact, even worse is some of the ways in which Romans treated the people they were, had enslaved. But there's not only from that extreme all the way to the other, where sometimes slaves could be hired out for other work. They sometimes uh, worked on contracts for their master. They could go home at night. They could go into town and enjoy themselves. It was all varieties of ways in which the institution of slavery was exercised in that period. Sometimes it was for a brief period of time to work off a debt or uh, to pay a penalty for a, for a crime or something. So the definition of slavery goes all the way from the absolute horrific 
to uh, a time of servitude. We don't know what Onesimus' um, situation was, but we do know that he ran away. And apparently, as he was running away, he relieved his master of some of his property. Well, eventually, Onesimus winds up uh, meeting Paul and comes to faith under Paul's uh, leadership and becomes a helper for Paul in his ministry. But now Paul is going to send Onesimus back to Philemon, and that's where we pick up on the letter. And Paul describes why he's sending Onesimus back. Some people say, oh, well, see, Paul supported slavery. No, because he knows what he's going to do by sending Onesimus back is to change Philemon's heart forever. He says, Onesimus, who is very useful to me, because that's actually what Onesimus translates into as useful. He says, where he used to be use, useless to you, he's now useful to me. But now he's going to be even more useful to you. How? By continuing to be a slave? No. Because he tells Philemon, when Onesimus comes back, I want you to receive him as you would receive me, a beloved brother in Christ. Not a slave, a beloved brother in Christ. And you see, that is the essence right there in that one line. Why? Because if Philemon looks at Onesimus as a beloved brother in Christ, it is categorically impossible to think of him as a slave, much less treat him as one. And that's the big fallacy in human relationships since the beginning of time, is that when we look at another person in something less than a human being, something less than what God created them to be. How can you treat someone as a slave? How can you treat someone like the Nazis did to Jewish people and so many other different peoples in the concentration camps? Is you have to strip them of their humanity. You have to make their life meaningless. And what Paul is saying, when you look at another person as a brother in Christ, that totally changes how you deal with that person. Even somebody that you totally disagree with, Maybe somebody that you've had a conflict with, somebody or, or some politician that you don't like. God is trying to get us to look at them the way he does. Now you might ask, well, what happens if that person isn't a brother in Christ? Well, how did our master Jesus teach us how to deal with people who aren't believers? Enough said. And so you see how just even just this one page letter we could easily spend the rest of the day, if we had the time, to talk about the ramifications of this. But I'm going to let you meditate on that as you read the letter. So as you read these letters, I invite you not to be in a hurry. Don't read them quickly just to get through them. They're short enough. You've got a whole month. We have the opportunity to read each one very carefully and savor its riches. Savor paragraph by paragraph, maybe line by line, and in some instances, word by word. And I guarantee you that if you spend time with these brief letters of Paul, that you will be richly blessed. And I pray that it will lead to an even deeper and more rich Christian life for you. God bless you.